arithmetic, the floating point operations, and the communication, and that's going to mean moving data either between levels of a memory hierarchy, of which there could be many, or between processors over a network. So here's going to be my very simple model to measure the optimality of an algorithm. I'll count the number of flops, I'll count the number of words moved, say, between two processors, and I'll count the number of messages, and a message is a contiguous chunk of words that have been packed together to move. And all three of those have separate costs associated with them, and so the hardware parameters are the time per flop, the reciprocal bandwidth, or the time per word, and the latency cost for the message, the last two being the communication. And as people in this audience probably know, these three hardware performers, per, uh, per, uh, parameters are orders of magnitude apart. It costs an order of magnitude more uh, time to uh, move a word than it does to do a floating point operation. And technological trends are making these gaps grow uh, asymptotically in time. So thanks to Moore's law and multi-core, the time for flop is getting better at 59% a year. And everything else is getting better, but much more slowly. So even if your algorithm is not communication bound today, it may be next year or the year after that. So our first goal is to avoid communication to save time. But that's not the only reason. Here is a plot of the energy it takes to perform the basic operations in the machine on a log scale. So a double precision floating point operation in today's technology takes 100 picojoules. The prediction is in 2018 it'll take 10 times less. Here, the next three bars are the uh, joules it takes to move data on chip, and these three bars are the, data, uh, the energy it takes to move off chip certain distances. And so you can see it's an order and a one and a half orders of magnitude more expensive per operation to move data off ship today, and everything's getting better, so it'll be two and a half orders of magnitude more expensive per operation to move data off chip in five years. So whether you're worried about the battery in your laptop dying or the million dollars per megawatt per year it costs to run your data center, you want to avoid communication to save energy. So here are the goals of this research agenda and my talk. So what I want to do is redesign all algorithms to avoid communication. That means in all senses, between all levels of memory hierarchy, L1 and L2 cache, L2 and DRAM networks and so forth. And whenever possible, prove lower bounds and prove that our new algorithms attain the lower bounds. And we'll see that's going to give us very large speed ups and energy savings. Now this work has taken sort of three different directions, and in my half hour I can only talk about two of them. So I'll start by talking about direct linear algebra. So new algorithms in as that are asymptotically faster for matrix multiply, we'll always start there. LU, QR, eigenvalue problems, singular value decomposition, tensor contractions, all of that. It's all possible for iterative linear algebra too. So conjugate gradient algorithms, things like that. I will, I'll just have a one slide summary. But, and it turns out that all the ideas that we had for direct linear algebra work for any algorithm that accesses arrays. That's all we need to assume about it, that we're accessing arrays and that the subscripts are somehow linear functions of your loop indices. Now, you don't have to take my word for it that this is a good idea. You can take the word of somebody at a higher pay scale, say, President Obama. So here's, here's a quote from the Department of Energy budget request for 2012. And it says, on modern computer architectures, communication is more expensive than floating point. And so to minimize communication, you have to reformulate all the communication patterns and make it work better. So this is referring to the Trilinos project, which is a widely used parallel solver developed at Sandia. So I asked, and we collaborate with them, so I asked Mike Carew what they were talking about. He says, it's algorithms that we developed here, and it was done by uh, my PhD student, Mark Homan, who now works on Trilinos, both communicating avoiding GM res and the tall, skinny QR algorithm that David Gleick talked about earlier this week. So anyway, uh, just to give you some motivation. So here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to survey the state of the art in direct linear algebra, and I'll spend my time, I'll go into detail in one particular algorithm, uh, n cubed, it's classical n cubed matrix multiply, but it now goes asymptotically faster than it did before. But earlier in the week, we've already heard three other talks, so I'll just refer to them. So Iden Bullish talked about all pairs shortest path using Floyd Warshall, same idea that goes asymptotically faster. David Gleick talked about tall, skinny QR, which is a building block for lots of things. And then Gray Ballard talked about communicating, avoiding Strassen. But so I'll just refer back to that. Then I'll have a few slides on how we go beyond linear algebra to anything that accesses arrays and a one slide summary of iterative methods. So let me start with a survey of what the lower bounds are for direct linear algebra and then how to attain it. And so this, is, this holds for anything that smells like three nested loops. And we have a formal definition of smells like, but your intuition is perfectly good right now. So let's let M be the fast memory size, and, and the problem is too big to fit in there, so I want to bound the communication that has to occur into and out of that fast memory. And the answer is that the words move for every processor 
is lower bounded by however many flops that processor happens to do divided by the square root of its local memory size. And in the parallel case, to sort of interpret this, you can think of it being load balanced. So the flops per processor is one piece of the total flops, and the memory it has is one piece of the total memory. So people have known this for a long time. So Hong and Kung proved this back in 81 or so for uh, sequential matrix multiply. But now, as I said, we know it holds for just about everything. So it holds for the basic linear algebra subroutines, for Gaussian elimination, any variant of it, QR eigenvalue problems, SVD, tensor contractions. It holds for whole programs. It executes sequences of these operations, so you can do multiple matrix multiplies. And no matter how you interleave those multiple operations, the lower bound still holds. It's true for both dense and sparse matrices, so the number of flops doesn't have to be n cubed anymore. It's however many operations that your sparse algorithm happens to do. You can, you can flip coins in the inner loop to decide what to do, and it's still however many flops that are done at the end. It holds for sequential and parallel algorithms. And indeed, you don't have to do multiplies and adds. You can do you know, other semi-ring operations, and that's the uh, floyd warshall algorithm that Iden Bullish talked about before. So that's the bandwidth lower bound. So what about the number of messages? So the simplest way to get a lower bound on that is to say, I'm going to send the largest possible messages. So I'll take the number of words I have to move, divide by the largest message size, and that'll give me a lower bound of the number of, of messages. What's the lower bound on the big, on the what, how big a message can I send? The whole memory. So I'm just going to take this bound and divide it by m, and it's just going to change the exponent. And that's going to be my goal to send that few messages. And I'm pleased to say that won a, a best paper prize. So given these lower bounds, the next question is, can we attain them? Or rather, the first question should be, do the existing algorithms and libraries like LAPAC and SCALAPAC and so forth attain them? And the answer is hardly ever, not even for matrix multiply. So we can, we have, there's lots of rooms for improvement. And so for basically all of dense linear algebra and, and some sparse too, we've been reinventing it. There are new algorithms. There are new numerical properties. We can't, for example, do partial pivoting anymore. We need a new kind of pivoting in order to attain the lower bounds new data structures and ways to encode the answers. I mean, we have to do loop transformations too, but that's not the only thing. And we're uh, now in the process of putting that into all the, the standard libraries. We can do some sparse algorithms. Um, you can imagine that you know, if your matrices are too sparse, you're not going to be able to attain these lower bounds, but that's another talk. So let me just stick with the dense case here. And uh, ditto for iterative linear algebra. So let me now uh, ask what these lower bounds tell us about the parallel case. And so what I'm going to do, is just to be concrete, I'm going to assume I have n by n matrices, keep everything square, on p processors. And I need to plug in the memory per processor into the lower bound. So let me make a reasonable sounding assumption that I use as little memory as possible. So every processor owns one piece of the data. So I'll plug that into the denominator. So when I use the lower bounds, each processor does one piece of the work. And m is plugged in there. And so there are my two lower bounds that I want to compare LA, uh, scale pack to. So it turns out that for the number of words moved, the bandwidth cost, Scalapack typically usually attains the lower bounds, except for the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem. It's much, much worse. But for the number of messages, it hardly ever attains the lower bound. It's way asymptotically more communication than necessary. And so our first step was to reinvent all those algorithms. And so we can attain the lower bounds for both bandwidth and latency for all of that. But then we asked ourselves, can we do better? And so that seems a little strange, because I just said we attained a lower bound. But I made an assumption, which was I used as little memory as possible. There's, the lower bounds are still true, even if the memory is larger than the minimum that you need. So um, can we attain it? I wouldn't ask the question if the answer weren't yes. So let's go on and do that. So I'm going to talk about our 2 and a half dimensional matrix multiply algorithm. And so I'm going to assume that I have not enough memory just for one copy, but I can fit C copies of the data, where C is you know, 1 or 2 or 3, whatever. So you can replicate the data. And I'm going to take my P processors and form a 2 and a half dimensional grid. The classical algorithm forms a 2D grid of processors, root P by root P. So I'm going to form a, a 3D grid, 2 and a half D grid, C by P over C square root and so forth. So that's what my processor grid is going to look like. And I'm going to assume my data is not replicated to begin with. It's just living in the top. So that processor owns that particular submatrix of A and that submatrix of B and so forth. So that's how it's all spread out. And I'm going to index all the, all the uh, processors by i, j, and k. And as I said at the beginning, that, uh, the data is only distributed across the top. So what's the algorithm? It's very simple. At the, begin at the first step, each processor at the top of a column broadcasts its submatrices to everybody below it. So everybody owns a copy. Then each layer is going to run one seeth of the classical algorithm, communication optimal algorithm, which is called summa. 
So it's going to compute, do one C through the work, one C through the communication, and compute a partial sum of all the data. And then in the last step, all the partial sums in one column, I'll just do a sum reduce, and the right answer will appear at the top. And if you do all the arithmetic, it turns out to hit the lower bound. So the question is, does this bias anything? How about a factor of 12? So, so here's an example of a speed up. So this is on a uh, 64,000 core BGP, a very small matrix at size 8K. You wouldn't think you'd want to use that many processors on, on an 8K by 8K matrix, and also a bigger one. And the vertical axis is percentage of peak, so up is good, and 100 is a max. And if you just run the classical 2D algorithm with no replication, you're getting like 2% of peak, which it's not worth using that many processors, but we go 12 times faster if we do the replication. Now, if you run the larger problem, then it's, much, it's not as com uh, communication bound, so we only get a 2.7x speed up. So let me show you what the timing breakdown is for this. So the same experiment, but now I'm going to show you where the time goes in communication, idle, and computation. So this is all normalized to the classical algorithm running in time one. And so you can see it's spending this much time doing communication, and it goes down by 95%. So the red bar goes down very small, the idle time goes away, and even the flops go faster. So why is that? That's because I'm locally multiplying larger submatrices on each processor, so the local blahs three run faster. So that's where we get that speed up. On the larger problem, it's not nearly, so the green part, the, the compute stays the same. It's not nearly as communication bound, but, so I only get a 2.7x speed up. But if that's where all your energy went into the communication, I might have just saved you 95% of the energy. So I'm pleased to say this won another paper prize. So, so this algorithm has a nice property, which is it gives you perfect strong scaling in both time and energy. So what does perfect strong scaling mean? Well, let me, let me define it. So every time you add a processor and you want to go faster, you're not just getting the hardware resource of the processor, you're getting its memory too, so you might as well use it. You've already paid for it. So what I'm going to do is ask, let me start with as few processors as it takes to fit all three matrices into memory. So 3n squared just barely fits. And I'm going to increase the number of processors by a factor of c and use all the memory, the extra factor of c uh, memory too, and see what happens. So I'm going to write down a performance model. So I need the seconds per flop, the seconds per word move, the reciprocal bandwidth, and the seconds per message. And I can write down this kind of messy formula for the time it takes to run on C times P processors. And all I want you to notice is how it scales. And it scales perfectly. It's C times faster. The flop time goes down by a factor of C. The bandwidth and the latency, they all go down by a factor of C. So that's perfect strong scaling in time. What about energy? So I've run this energy model past our hardware colleagues. So they kind of buy it. And so I'm going to count the number of joules per flop, the joules per word moved along the network, the joules per message. But of course, there's other places you burn energy. So the memory is burning energy no matter what happens. So I'm going to count the joules per word per second that the memory is burning. And then also the leakage and all the other the fans and whatever. That's another term. And so let me just write down a, a long, messy formula for the energy it takes to run on C times P processors. And all I care about is how it scales. And it scales perfectly. It doesn't matter how, how fast you solve it. It takes the same amount of energy to, to solve it C times faster. So how can that be? I'm, each processor is burning the same amount of power, uh, and I have p times as many of them, c times as many of them, but they all run one seeth as long, so the, so the energy is constant. So, so that's a nice property that these algorithms have. And it's not just matrix multiply, it applies to n body and Strassen and all sorts of things. So let me just sort of summarize some of the ongoing work in this. We have lots of other algorithms for which we can do all this stuff. As I said, the BLAS, LU, symmetric indefinite factorization, QR. There's lots of you know, innovation required in pivoting. We have to get rid of all the old pivoting schemes and do new ones because the old ones were very communication expensive. And because this is a big data conference, let me just mention we figured out how to do QR with column pivoting. How do you select the most independent columns and hit these lower bounds? Um, we have some sparse matrix algorithms. That's another long talk. You can imagine, I mean, there's no magic if you multiply two diagonal matrices. You know, the lower bound is not attainable. But if you make some assumptions, so for example, sparse Koleski, we can do for certain sparsity structures. We can attain the lower bounds. Um, it, it's running on, so, and we just proved a new lower bound, I should mention, that if you increase C in, in the case of matrix multiply, the bandwidth and the latency went down. And we attained it. But if you're doing LU or QR, is something where you have a dependency from the top corner to the bottom corner, the latency is minimized with one copy of the data. And so if you want, the, so the lower bound says, if you want to minimize bandwidth, copies help. If you want to minimize latency, one copy is the best. So depending on your hardware costs, you may or may not choose to do the replication. 
We're sort of putting this in all sorts of different platforms. I'm not sure if David Gleick mentioned, like, we get 13x speedups on a GPU for doing our, yeah, there's lots of speedup numbers, you know, 13x speedups on a GPU for tall skin EQR and so on and so forth. Um, and we're integrating this into all these libraries and also into lots of packages. So, for example, tensor uh, contractions smells enough like three nested loops that all of the ideas here apply. And there are a bunch of quantum chemists who spend all their time doing uh, tensor contractions in quantum chemistry. So that's getting inter integrated into a package called the Cyclops Tensor Framework that the quantum chemistry uh, community is using. Okay. So now let me go beyond linear algebra and say how all this, all this extends to kind of arbitrary code that accesses arrays. And I'm going to illustrate it. Instead of stating the general result first, I'll just uh, apply it to some simple examples. So let's go back to matrix multiply. Here's the classic unoptimized naive code, three nested loops uh, over i, j, and k. And there I'm doing the matrix multiply. And we've all known for a long time that if you want to minimize the communication, and this is two-level memory model, perfectly sequential, what am I going to do? I'm just going to block the code. I'm going to break up my matrices into B by B blocks. So this square bracket now refers to a submatrix. And I'll have three nested loops, but it's over blocks, and the inner loop is doing a B by B matrix multiply. And as we've all known for a long time, if I pick the block size right, just a little bit less than m to the 1 half, so that these three blocks all fit into fast memory, then that attains the lower bound, which is n cubed over m to the 1 half. So the question is, where do all these 1 halves come from? So now, let me tell you what the new theorem says, applied just to matrix multiply. So here's the code. And all I need to know about the code, I I'm going to write down in this little 3 by 3 matrix that just tells me which arrays have which subscripts. So there's one column for each uh, loop index, i, j, k, one row for each array. And there's a 1 because A has i as a subscript and k as a subscript, but not j. That's everything I need to know. So the, I, the theory goes on to say, I need to solve a little 3 by 3 linear program with this matrix. So the linear program says, please maximize the sum of the x's subject to delta times x is less than or equal to 1. And out pops 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. And the sum of the x's, the value of the linear program, is 3 halves. I'm going to give that a name called S sub HBL. HBL are the acronyms of three famous mathematicians. You can guess who they are, but I'll tell you in a couple of slides. So the theorem says that no matter how you reorganize this algorithm, the optimal communication is n cubed, the number of loop indices, divided by m to the magic answer minus 1. That's where that 1 half comes from. And the, it's attained by block sizes m to the xi, xj, xk, or m to the 1 half, m to the 1 half, m to the 1 half. So let me just apply it again to another example, which is direct n body. Let's see if it tells us anything. So there I have two nested loops. I take every pair of particles, compute the force. And I have the same little matrix that has one column for each loop index, one row for each uh, array access, and ones and zeros. I'm going to solve a little even smaller linear program. And it out pops the solution 1, 1, and the sum is 2. That's the S sub HBL. And so the theorem says that no matter how I reorganize this n-body algorithm, then I have to move at least this many words, the number of loop iterations, n squared, divided by m to the power 1. And it's attained by these block sizes. So let's see if that gives us anything. And the point is, this applies even when m is bigger than the amount of data. Right? I can do this replication trick. So let's see how much faster I go. And again, I get a 12x speed up by using this trick to do the n-body algorithm. So, I'm, so this is an n-body algorithm where I'm using 32,000 particles on 8,000 cores. This seems silly. It's four particles per core. It seems like it'll be totally communication bound. And indeed, if I only have one copy of the data, c equals 1, then this, is, this vertical axis is running time. The red is compute, and the green is communication. And I'm spending all my time communicating. But if I have two copies of the data or four copies of the data, do the replication trick, eventually the communication goes away entirely. It's completely compu compute bound, as I would hope, and it, I get perfect strong scaling. So, so for those of you in the database world, you might recognize that uh, join looks exactly the same as this if you run the classical join algorithm. And so this hopefully might give us speed ups there. Of course, join has lots of other you know, optimizations too I don't want to go into, but it's the, same, it's the same analysis. So now let me apply the theorem one more time to eh, random code and, and random PowerPoint too. So why did it do, do that? Let me, let me just start over. OK. So I basically wrote down random code. 
I decided, let me have six nested loops. The loop indices are going to be I1 through I6. And I just write, wrote down some random subscripts in the middle, and what does my theorem tell me? So everything I need to know about this code, I encode in the six by six matrix with six columns, one for each loop index, six rows, one for each array. And what I'm going to do is solve the same little six by six linear program, and out pops this bunch of numbers, whatever they mean, and their sum is 15 sevens. That's the S sub HBL. So the theorem says that no matter how I reorganize this code, then I can't move fewer than n to the 6, the number of loop iterations, divided by m to the 15 sevenths minus 1. That's optimal. And it's attained by these block sizes that, where the exponents just come out of the solution of the linear program. This is not real code. It's just you know, an example. So now, let me tell you, summarize the high level, what's the theory behind all this? All the theory for linear algebra extends to any code where I can basically have an inner loop that I uh, access, uh, that I uh, uh, execute, and I can index it by a bunch of integers, right, d integers. So the easiest thing to do is think of d-nested loops, but I could write recursive code. It could be anything. I just have to be able to index the inner loop. Then the arrays in the inner loop are subscripted by arbitrary linear functions of these uh, indices. So for example, I could refer to a sub i1, i2 minus i1, 3 i1 minus 4 i2, you know, whatever linear combinations you want. And it's also okay to have pointers. I mean, it doesn't have to be really an array. All I need is that once I have this linear function, I have, that gives me a unique memory location. So I could have hash tables and whatever you want. Five minutes, good. So, and it can be dense or sparse. I mean, I don't have to do you know, a cube here, like a matrix multiply. I can, I can have an arbitrary subset of sparse stuff. So the theory that, uh, that we use is based on a recent result in pure mathematics by this team of pure mathematicians, including my colleague Mike Christ, who's a collaborator in this, Terry Tao at UCLA. And it's a generalization of a whole bunch of classical inequalities from functional analysis, including Holder's inequality and the brass camp leap inequality. And now you see where HBL comes from and Loomis-Whitney and so forth. And so what we can do using their theory is write down a linear program with one inequality per subgroup of ZD. There are a lot of subgroups of ZD, but I'll, I'll get to that. And the solution to this linear program is that magic exponent, S sub HBL, that I was showing you before. And the theorem says that the number of words moved, no matter how you reorganize that code, is lower bounded by the number of loop iterations divided by m to that magic exponent that comes out of this linear program. Now, this looks like a problem to write down this linear program because there's an infinite number of subgroups of ZD. So what ZD is the group of d-tuples of integers under addition, right? That's, that's an abelian group. So the question is, can I write down the lower bound? So it turns out that even though there seem to be an infinite number of inequalities, there's still really only finitely many, because the coefficients are constrained to be in a range from zero to the dimension. So there really only are a finite number of inequalities. The trick is to find them and write them down. So when we first worked on this, we had bad news. It turned out that if you actually want to write down every inequality that could come up, it's equivalent to solving Hilbert's 10th problem over the rational numbers. Now, we all know what Hilbert's 10th problem over the integers is. That was proved undecidable back in the 60s. That's the question of, you're given an integer polynomial, does it have an integer solution? That's undecidable. On the other hand, there's also Hilbert's 10th problem over the reals. Does a real polynomial have a real solution? That's Tarski decidable. We've known that for a long time. So Q is in between. This problem has been open for 40 years. Nobody knows if it's decidable or not. So that kind of got us stuck for a while. But, but then we realize it's possible to write down another linear program it's decidable to write down another linear program that provably has the same solution. So we don't have to trigger Hilbert's 10th problem. So everything is decidable. The complexity is nuts right now, but we're working on that. And it's in even better news is in the special cases that I showed you where the subscripts of your arrays are just subsets of the loop indices, it's easy to write it down. It's just that delta matrix. So it's, it's very easy to write down. So the, then the obvious question is, can I attain these lower bounds? And clearly, this is going to depend on the loop dependencies, right? If I have strange enough code so that I'm, there's only one correct uh, iteration order that I can go through the loops, I'd have no freedom at all to reorganize it. So let me assume, in the best case, that either there are no dependencies or, like matrix multiply, there are reductions. So I have total freedom in reorganizing it. Then what we can prove is that when the subscripts are just subsets of indices, like in linear algebra or n body or join, the dual linear program tells us the optimal block sizes. So all those examples I showed you before were the dual of the linear program that comes out of the theory of, of, of functional analysis. And that covers all these different examples. Now, we've been trying to you know, do lots of other examples, and we've never not been able to attain the lower bound. So we're, we conjecture that we can always attain, attain the lower bound modulo those dependencies. But that remains an open problem. So I only have a minute left. 
and I'm going to have a one slide summary of how this all works for iterative methods. And so what is an iterative method? I want to solve AX equal B or solve an eigenvalue problem. I have a sparse matrix. And if I take K steps of the algorithm, what does it do? I'm going to do K sparse matrix vector multiplies. I'm going to get K vectors. I'll take some linear combination of those vectors, and I'll get a solution of my, linear, of my, of my problem. And there's you know, 50 years of development of these kinds of methods, conjugate gradient, GM res, land shows, and so forth. So what I want to do is minimize communication. And to make it easy to understand, let me assume the matrix is well partitioned. So that means I can sort of divide it up in a graph partitioning sense with very few edges crossing from one partition to another. So let me say what the serial case is. So what does a conventional algorithm do? I have to do k sparse matrix vector multiplies. The matrix is too big to fit in cache, so I have to move it k times from slow to fast memory. So the communication cost grows like k. It turns out that for all these algorithms, we can reorganize it to touch the data once and still take k steps of the algorithm. One is a lower bound. Right? So there, there, that's, there's a lot of algebra here that I'm going to skip. That's the serial case. What about the parallel case? So I'm, I've spread out my matrix over P processors. The conventional algorithm is going to take K steps. What's that going to cost me? At each step, I have to talk to my neighboring processors, get some data from them. And I also have to probably do a dot product. So that's a reduction. It's going to cost me log P messages to do the tree. And so the cost is going to grow like K log P. We can reorganize it so it's independent of k again. It costs you one reduction to take k steps of the algorithm. And so there's a lot to say here. There's lots of speed up possible. We have implementations. It's, all, it's going into a bunch of DOE codes. And the price we pay sometimes is redundant computation. But that's OK, because flops are very cheap. That's the whole theme of this meeting, of, of this talk. And there's a lot of challenges, though. What if your matrix is not well partitioned? Well, we can handle some cases. And I can talk about that for some time. Numerical stability, there are a lot of ways to do it. The obvious ways are completely numerically unstable. You get garbage because of round off, and so you have to pick the right way to do it. And uh, so let me just say, this is a lot of ongoing work. And for those details, you can find a lot of papers at our website. Um, I teach you know, part of my parallel computing course, which is broadcast by the NSF now. Uh, so you can all listen to me blather on about it next semester at great length. It's all available there. And so let me just say that this is a team and there are a lot of people who are working on this in lots of different supporting organizations, so thank you very much. And uh, the summary is it's time to redesign everything. Linear algebra code, n-body algorithm software, and compilers. Because all of this analysis, you know, you'd think compilers could do it, and we are collaborating with the compiler community now. And the thing that's going to make it all work is don't communicate. <laughs> Any questions?